technology compo component in the Heinrich Boll Foundation in Central America office based in, El Salva in San Salvador, and Gabriela Bulnes, professor of the food technology career in the Regional Center of the National Autonomous University of Honduras, and she is a member of the Food and Nutritional Security Observ Observatory of this university. We thank you very much uh, um, for your participation in this webinar. As you can see, we have many questions. And I also thank for, um, I am thanking those people who are joining this webinar to introduce themselves and use the the Q&A on Zoom, and also uh, the ones who are in chat. You can tell us where you're logging in from, what is your country, what organization you represent. And to, to continue with the conversation, I'm going to ask you to, to be brief in, in your responses. I know that you can get excited, but we invite you to please um, be very specific on your um, answers. That way we can cover uh, many more angles and and we can um, have a, a richer conversation with the people in the seminar. So to start with, we want to define these concepts, climate change and food security. Both uh, are seen as topics that are very broad and very uh, difficult to, to go very specific on. But I'm going to start by telling, asking you, Ingrid, what is climate change? Good morning. It is a pleasure to be here with all of you. Thank you for inviting me. Um, maybe the first thing that we have to say when we talk about climate change is to clarify a confusion that often happens and is thinking that climate change and global warning and greenhouse effect are the same thing, and they're not. When we understand these concepts separately, we can know the complexity and what you're saying, that we cannot specify what climate change is. Climate change is called to the effect that human actions have on the atmosphere, but also on the biosphere, all, all of the earth, uh, on the cryosphere, Fear, which are the, the poles uh, on the oceans and even in society. So how the human actions have effect on all of these spheres and how these spheres change and how the interrelation of these spheres change as well. So it's something very complex. Climate change, um, the effect cannot be understood in all of the effects that is that, that are taking place. And it's contrary to when we speak only with global warning, warming. Global warming is the increase of temperature, yes, the average um, temperature of Earth, which has been very stable in the last 11,000 uh, years. Uh, it has been very stable thanks to these mechanisms that make Earth um, remain leveled in their in their temperature and as humans we have made a very brusque um, change in the temperature we have made temperature to increase uh, global warming is natural but humans have made it gone quickly so earth has gone through different te average temperatures currently as i was telling you we were in 13.6 now we're almost 15 degrees in this last year but in the last 11,000, it's about it has been about 13.6 for earth to suffer these changes because we have had different uh, temperatures to go up or down a degree it was about 15 um hundred years but from 2005 to 2016 we had an increase of almost one degree in 10 years so that sudden change in the global temperature is a direct effect of human activity so that is the first thing that we have to understand and the second thing that i want to reaffirm because maybe some of the people who are here have heard of it is that climate change is real and it is a direct effect of human uh, actions um, now that we see all of the effects of climate change we sh we can't be saying or debating if it's real or not um, in the here i'm gonna leave many links where all the science behind uh, climate change is, is explained and that it is caused by humans. So in a summary, all the climate models 
that are made cannot be simulate this sudden change of temperature that we have been gone through in the last few years since the industrial revolution if we don't put all the human aspects within what we create to simulate it so there is no way to simulate the global change of temperature without the human factor in these models that is why we can say that it is real and that it is happening that because there are still people that don't believe it. And very briefly, I want to explain the greenhouse effect, which is the easiest to understand. Climate change is a little bit more complex, but greenhouse effect is the process that takes to the increase of temperature on Earth. Greenhouse effect is not something exclusive of uh, climate change that existed before climate change and that has allowed the temperature of earth to remain um, in, in a livable uh, way if greenhouse effect wouldn't exist the earth would have about nine minus 19 degrees celsius it would be we couldn't live here so greenhouse effects effect is not bad. The problem is that the atmosphere is composed uh, basically of gas. We have um, oxygen, uh, the, the second main, and nitrogen. These gases don't interact with the heat and radiation of sun. And we have gases that are much less, which are the greenhouse effect gases that do interact with heat. They allow the radiation of the sun to come in, but they don't allow uh, the radiation from the earth back to the sun. So that is what creates the heat that we can live in as humans. The problem is that as humanity, due to the burning of fossil fuels, uh, the use of soil and all the economy that we are creating and the resources that we are burning, mainly we have created a lot of gases from the greenhouse effect that are we are making its concentration to be so high that it won't allow more radiation uh, to be radiated from the earth to the universe which creates um, global warming so these are three things that we have to understand what is climate change what is global warming and greenhouse effect to have a clear concept that it's something real that it does exist that there's a lot of science be behind all of this there's the panel of about 1300 people experts who usually create these reports where they they come to an agreement on the status of science and since 2014 with 90 95 of security they say that climate change is a direct effect of human action thank you ingrid and having a little uh, clear definitions of global warming, climate change, and greenhouse effect. Now we're going to define what secu a few security is. Thank you, Gabriela. Thank you for the invite. And uh, good morning to everyone. And yes, food security, we're going to find two similar concepts. One that comes from the UN, it defines food security as a, a level of the individual household or, or country when one person at all times had physical economic access and enough access of food. However, I like the definition from the, the INCAP, which is the Nutritional Institute of Central America. So it, this tells us that food security is a status where a person enjoys appropriately and permanently a physical economic access of the food they need in terms of quality and quantity, which is appropriate to its own consumption and guaranteeing um, a well-being for this person. I like this definition more than the one from FAO, because INCAP uh, includes on one hand the term of quality and quantity, which is something that I want to clarify, because if, if we see at food security as just as uh, climate change and global warming, they're broad, these are broad terms, but 
food security includes um, quality and quantity of food. And uh, we will see if we go into the internet and, and start looking around or start uh, making some research, we're going to discover that different countries or different regions have di different concepts or, or, or approaches of, to food security. And something that I have noticed is that in developed countries, food security is going to be focused on the quality of food, the microbiological, physical, uh, chemical, or organoleptic. But in underdeveloped countries, food security is going to focus on the amount of food and access to food, which is what, which is what truly limits this uh, underdeveloped countries or developing countries. Thank you, Gabriela. So to continue with the definition that we have now that you have shared with us, uh, and this is a question for, for both of you. How was the Central American region uh, on the months previous to the pandemic? Maybe Ingrid can start. In terms of climate change, the Central American uh, region has always been one of the most vulnerable ones. The countries all are always fighting between the top 10 of vulnerable con countries in the German watch list. Honduras, Guatemala, El Salvador um, have headed uh, these lists. El Salvador is currently in at number 15. Costa Rica and Panama have lowered as well. But Honduras, Guatemala, and Nicaragua are still some of the most vulnerable. And, and the region as such is very vulnerable. In a great extent, we're talking about um, a region vulnerable to climate change, but also the population has been violated, the lack of infrastructure and, and all of this. So this region is very vulnerable because it's within the dry corridor. Within the dry corridor, or 90% of the population in Central America lives in dry, the dry corridor, which has a deficit of rain in very frail territories where people usually work on um, growing staple grains. Within the dry corridor, 60% of the population grows staple uh, grains and um, a high percentage lives under the poverty line due to uh, the climate. But also this comes uh, hand in hand with structural problems of the system that go beyond how we prioritize that, the way in which we, we grow um, the food. But in terms of climate change, uh, we found more drought. In 2008, we had drought. Sorry, in 2018, we had a terrible year in terms of drought. Uh, we lost 70% of the first uh, crops because of drought. And then the second crop was lost in 50% because of flooding. So that left the region without any staple grains specifically for those vulnerable families. So climate change overall uh, stunts the economic growth of Central America and the fight against poverty. So it's one of the factors that we have to take into account when we talk about social um, things like migration, violence, poverty. There are a lot of percentages. I'm going to leave more information. Exact. I'm going I'm to leave the, the German watch because um, they're the ones that speak more about this. But we're going to... but. It's because uh, Central America is one of the most vulnerable regions. In Comcan, uh, I was able to to go to go to this convention, and even when they were talking about migration and climate change, the the picture that Al Gore showed was from El Salvador, from the Jiclisco Bay, showing the effects of drought in 2018, especially in the mangroves, which is a very productive uh, area of plantings usually, but it was completely drought dry uh, looked from the satellite lens. So that is a reference of vulnerability uh, worldwide, unfortunately. And in terms of food security, 
we can relate that those droughts from 2017 and 2018 with food insecurity because um, the impact that or the impact from that drought in those two years was seen in in the economic growth of population which is translated into a difficulty to access food or to have access to food however at least in the central american area uh, up to the months before the pandemic there were a lot of organizations especially from uh, WFP and FAO, they were working in that area by strengthening the effects of food insecurity in vulnerable populations. That, that was uh, the months prior to the pandemic. However, poverty in the region makes it difficult. Also, the geography of the region makes it difficult for people to access food and, and even to access these programs by the vulnerable population in terms of uh, food insecurity. So what are we going to see? We are going to see that uh, bet between El Salvador, which is uh, Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras, between um, all those three countries, uh, El Salvador has less poverty. But if we look at Honduras, where 48% of population lives under poverty, and we are going to, and we're going to see, and we're going to see that the location of that poverty in what Ingrid said, in that dry corridor, in that region of the dry corridor where we, where we can see the influence of, um, of climate change in food security, how climate change influences and how the episodes where large amounts of food were lost influenced the nutritional status of this population. So the vulnerable population increased and they are in food insecurity. However, we had a response from different NGOs and even government programs to counter or to try to mitigate the food insecurity in these populations. Thank you to both of you. So we can then see that the current pandemic is making people become double the double of uh, vulnerable and the double of food insecure, but also as because of the measures of confinement that we have had in the last two or three months. So what elements have become more complicated because of COVID in terms of the work that has been done in terms of um, climate change and food security in Central America? Which situations have, have become more complex uh, during this pandemic, during these measures of economic reactivation and in the context of the of the health emergency. So maybe Ingrid and, and then Gabriela, you can uh, tell us about which these elements that make it much more complex. So because of the pandemic, and I think you heard also and you saw the images in terms of climate change, we saw many images of uh, how the earth was being cleaned, uh, like parts of the atmosphere because of the reduction of, of travel, because of the reduction of uh, burning fossil fuels and, and because of the uh, less use of transportation, yachts, etc. We saw that and yes, that's a, a small hope and that shows us the great effect that humans have on the ecosystem and climate, but it also 
tell us that we're capable of changing. The change was was because of a pandemic and, and a disease, but it gives us hope that we are able to change and we are able to reflect. Maybe we can do it uh, because of conviction and not because we are obliged to stay home because of a disease. So that's on the, on the one hand. But uh, that's the only positive thing. Historically, we have shown that after these kinds of pandemics or crisis, and even though we haven't gone through this, but in 2008, the financial crisis also um, led to the the reduction of these great emissions of CO2, which is a gas from the greenhouse effects, because there was a decrease in the burning of fossil fuels. It was reduced in 1.4% due to the economic crisis, but in 2010, it increases almost 6% because of the economic reactivation and all of the of the processes to go back. So we think that we're gonna see something similar to after this crisis, the fuel has dropped so, so much that um, more things are gonna be uh, sold because it's so cheap right now. Plastic is one of it, uh, not only fuel, so it's gonna be launched, uh, the production, because we're gonna look for other ways on how to create products that can be sold to economy, economy and society based on this fuel, which is so cheap at the moment. So this is not gonna be a long-term positive, the effects that we're seeing right now, it's it's probably going to become negative uh, later on. So that's on the one hand. But on the other hand, it's, it has been hard to continue the climate negotiations between governments. So these uh, global initiatives, uh, both of climate, of, of biodiversity and oceans that were canceled for next year are a victim of this pandemic as well that no one talks about and the governments are not prioritizing on climate change right now because despite of the pandemic that we are living through we cannot forget that now more than ever it's very urgent to uh, see these commitments of the governments both locally and internationally to reduce the ef the effects that we're having of climate change so also the difficulty of not being able to have the leaders of all of these states come together and continue with the negotiations is is something that is not very good this year was decisive in the un for climate change and new challenges were gonna be shown to 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 stay behind or, or under this 1.5 percent and this didn't happen the governments of central america haven't thought haven't talked about what they're gonna do if they're gonna come up with new ndcs or 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 with new commitments, or if they're gonna remain with the same commitments. So this topic is not being addressed because it's not a priority right now. And that is a shame because climate change is not gonna wait for us. And in terms of food security, unfortunately, and the perspective uh, facing COVID, it's not, uh, very good. We can see it from, from access to food. To start with, with the pandemic, we see a reduction in, in employability. So there is an, an increase in unemployment, the number of people that are employed by a house, household reduced almost 50%. And this was a poll made by FAO. So that's on the one hand, that limits access to food. On the other hand, we also see production of food. Through a confinement or through the lockdown, many produce that had to be grown at that time didn't, weren't grown or weren't planted. So. So we are seeing a delay in uh, growing produce or the stop of it. And we are seeing that a lot of the region made a change in, in food production. They are focusing on agro exports and 
local consumption of food are, is imported because that increases economy and has more profitability. But right now that we have blocked borders, there is a shortage of food and there is an increase in the price of food, which makes it much more difficult for people to access food, which is reflected in the fact that people or families reduce the consumption of the main food even either in volume they're consuming less quantity or in quality they consume food that have less quality in terms of nutrition so that's on the one hand on the other hand the programs that are destined to agriculture and that are destined to growing crops uh, that promote the improvement of, of, of the improvement of this food security in this vulnerable population had to change because of the lockdown. So, so the access is becoming more, much more difficult. The access to seed, the access to the access to ag input is very difficult, specifically in the rural area, in the countryside, in the mountainside, both in Honduras and Guatemala. And uh, in the end, this is going to have a great repercussion in the volume of food that is going to be produced, at least uh, 2020 or 2021. And what is the the perspective of this environmental reality and this food reality in the migration of people from Honduras, El Salvador, and Guatemala? And this is a topic that might seem um, detached, but as you as we said at the beginning of the conversation, there is a linkage between cli climate change, food security, and migration. So, what's your perspective of this reality? Uh, that you just show that just talk to uh, talk to us about um, in the mobilization of uh, people from Honduras, El Salvador, and Guatemala. Ingrid, as you were mentioning uh, at the beginning, the World Bank study uh, makes this uh, provision that uh, more or less uh, 3.9 million people from Mexico and Central America might be migrating because of climate change processes. However, this relationship is not linear. It's very complex. Uh, also migration uh, is, has a multi different causes, not only because of climate change, but the factor of climate change oftentimes is underestimated in the causes of migration. And sometimes it's not visible and it's not analyzed because it is seen as a process of ecosystems, which is detached from society. We still think that uh, all of these things are not related to each other. So the first thing is that when we speak about uh, climate change and migration, we have to think about two different processes. The first one is that we have uh, the progressive uh, processes, uh, long lasting, like the, the increase of sea level. Uh, for instance, due to climate change, the dry corridor has increased in 10% of its size than, 20, than it was 25 years ago. So many more families live in the dry corridor, but it has been a, a gradual and a slow process. It, it is not a sudden process. So its analysis become, becomes complex in the social dynamics. The same thing with the, the increase of sea level. This is a slow process that happens currently in the Central American uh, region. Panama has had to move communities in the islands because of the increase of sea level. So in Panama, there are the first climate official migrants that has had to be um, taken out of their communities because the, the sea has come in so much that it has covered the coast almost completely. And on the other hand, we have the sudden events. And these are hurricanes, flooding, drought, uh, tornadoes, uh, forest fires because of the increase uh, of temperature, which become uh, massive. And we are seeing this 
a lot and and even more in this region but also worldwide there have been landslides uh storms all of these sudden events are easier to incorporate or to uh, include in the analysis of climate change for instance we were saying in 2018 there were two events the drought at the beginning of the year which made people lose 70 percent and the strong storms on the second part of the year which lost 50 percent of the crops but we can we are also going to add the process of desertification that is happening in the central american region the increase of the dry corridor area as well as the degradation of ecosystems because it's as a mechanism that is uh, if we deforest then we are also taking out the capacity of the ecosystems to become resilient and to absorb these impacts um, in a better way. Also, these progressive uh, long-lasting processes reduce the resilience of communities and society. The other ones are the ones that, that uh, make an impact, but it makes it harder for a community in a hillside to grow and it, it becomes uh, less resilient to these changes. Or the communities in the coast, which are the most affected, not only in our region, but nationwide. So the perspective for Central America continues to be similar. There haven't been changes. Oftentimes we speak that Central America is working strongly to counter the effects of climate change. Each country has a different focus. Some are focused on mitigation and not adaptation, but uh, clearly it's not enough what they're doing because we are looking at this as isolated uh, processes, not as a holistic process that we have to change as a so, yeah, society. We have to change the way we produce food the way we consume food um, as, as the number one thing as a agricultural and also of prioritizing the communities that are becoming more vulnerable and not the economies to change and in terms of food security we can see that this goes hand in hand with what is happening with climate change and which is reflected in an increase of migration. Why? Because if there is an increase in drought or something that uh, puts it at risk the food production, we're going to see that the population is obliged to migrate either internally or or migrating to the United States. However, this is going to lead us to to see different things. So I have seen policies and legislation in terms of food security, and I've, I've seen that all countries have an exaggerated amount of standards and laws uh, in terms of uh, food and nutritional security but there is no synergy between uh, between the governments or the government policies and the ngos that are in charge or that are working towards mitigating food insecurity we see that there there is a detachment um when promoting this, uh, this uh, policies and putting these programs into action, which makes it difficult to mitigate uh, the vulnerable groups that would ensure um, agricultural production and, uh, and food, because there is no there is no policy or there is no support to to the mandatory production of food that are locally consumed we're always looking for a greater profitability in the in the agricultural sector 
So what does this do? This uh, changes the agricultural production of the region. And this leads us to, or for instance, something that is happening in Honduras and speci specifically in the region where I live, which is an agro export region, they are in the streets. These are products that are not are not consumed in the region and they cannot be exported. So there is a lot of food wastage right now that they are going to waste. They are not being used. And uh, there is a deficiency in the production of food that is truly needed or, or, or food that is locally consumed. So the perspective that we are going to have is that there is no there is no true linkage between the programs that are or that are that can lead us to achieve food security in all of the population and specifically in these vulnerable groups we're going to see that these vulnerable groups coincide with the dry corridor and uh, all the area of, of dry corridor that Ingrid has talked about, we are going to see that that same population as the dry corridor expands, we're gonna have a great, more population at risk of food insecurity. And uh, added to this is uh, unemployment, social insecurity, and all of the other factors of migration. And we're going to see an increase uh, of migration in this area to um, other places in the country or abroad. And in terms of access to natural resource and to food resources, which community models supported by the international cooperation or the ac academia have seen as real uh, solutions to the lack of access to water and the nutritional support? And let's take into account the community models because oftentimes they are much more um, efficient uh, than the policies uh, that you were talking about. And from your perspective, from the co cooperation and academia, which models can you share with us as real solutions that can be seen and that, that the communities are, are uh, implementing to these issues of lack of water and uh, nutritional support? So first of all, uh, this group that I was telling you about in the beginning, which is IPCCS, which is the, the group of experts on, on climate change, which is uh, 1,300 uh, experts from around the world that collect all of the information that is uh, coming out uh, in terms of uh, climate change. And they get to a consensus of, of what they can uh, see as valid and as a status of science as a whole. Obviously, there are also points that have to be taken into account, for instance, Politicians cannot directly influence on what is going to include the, the report, but they can um, say that there's a data that they, they don't want to see in the report. So that's why these reports are more subtle than uh, the urgency that they that, that it should have. But the, the IPCC um, brought three reports last year, which were very important. The first one is 1.5 degrees, which speaks about the relevance of not going over the 1.5 degrees that we're going to get to in by 2040 if we continue this way. And the drastic impact that that is going to have on societies and on ecosystem. The second one, which is the one that I'm going to refer to right now, is the report on Earth and climate change. This is the first time that a true report came out such a complex and broad report that spoke so clearly about the relationship of the use of soil with climate change usually we focus on burning fossil fuels and we leave agri the agricultural topic on the side but in agriculture all of the input also have all, all of the ag input has a lot of fuel and it uses a lot of plastic and it is uh, that is is made about um byproducts of fuel and the transport of food from one side 
to the other. And also the mono uh, crops, crops, where it's uh, produced in one side and then consumed in another side, create a great impact in climate change. So um, last year, the IPCC confirms that we cannot achieve the goal of not going over the 1.5 degrees if we don't drastically change the um, agricultural production to systems that are agroforestal and agroecological with a greater protection of the um, wetlands of the forests uh, etc and it tells us that we are not going to achieve just with the energy transition and with the decarbonization of societies to to remain under the 1.5 if we don't work on the transformation of our, of our agricultural systems that also changes our diet how we eat which is also inside food security some eat a lot some eat nothing some eat food that doesn't it's not nutritious it also talks about the loss of food, which is almost 40% of the total that is, that is produced worldwide, which has a great effect in climate change, in the emissions of climate change. So all of the process on how we produce, how we distribute the produce, how we waste the produce or the food, and how we eat our food, the ones who don't eat and those who eat a lot so it is a very wide report and also aside from saying that trans the immediate transformation of this agroforestry or, or agricultural um, processes uh, it also revalues and puts uh, in the middle the importance of having programs for the poor and for the indigenous communities to have access to land and to have local uh, crops with uh, a focus on this indigenous people uh, and the fishery groups. And it acknowledges that these communities are the key uh, role or the key um, the key link to make changes in climate change and also mentioning the role of women as one of the main links in the reduction of climate change. We have creation res resilience in communities and mitigation as well. So most of the actions that are focused on transforming the food systems and to fight, and I'm gonna say fight, and fight the communities in the, with this extractivist, industries of palm, of uh, peanuts, of bananas, of cane, and all of these monocrops that hoard great extensions of land, taking the, the possibility of these uh, communities to produce their food, not only for their own communities, but for their surrounding areas are a great issue. And if we don't change this, we're, we're not going to remain under these 1.5 degrees. So especially for us, for the agricultural Central American region, it is urgent for us to start promoting these transformations and for us to support communities to, um, to bring forward these agroforestry uh, processes. We not only have to focus on processes of reforestation because these are not gonna have the desired impact and they're not gonna happen in the necessary time. What we have to do is that we have to urgently protect what we have right now, mangroves, protected areas, specifically wetlands. This is what we have to be doing and this is what the governments have to focus on, on as well as all of us, as society. We have to protect what we already have and to transform the systems of production of food of, from monocrops to diverse crops and for local consumption. And uh, new things come, come on board like uh, solidarity economies or circling uh, economies and all of those are focused on consumption uh, and production locally where we detach ourselves from these large companies. I don't know if I'm speaking too much, but there's something that is very important, and it's the fact of who are creating these gases, which we didn't talk about in the, in the before. We can say it in 
two um, ways. The great na nations, which is ch uh, China, Russia, US, also Germany and, and, and Japan. And these have a responsibility, but beyond these countries, we have to see the companies. There's always a study that comes forward, the, the, the big ones in, in carbon, where a company is uh, measured how much gases of greenhouse effect they have created since it was established. And it was determined that 63% of all of the gases of greenhouse effects that have been emitted uh, since the 1800s are due to 90 big companies like Shell, Chevron, obviously, because they're full uh, fuel companies, but also Halsing, which is a cement um, company which uh, have great emissions of greenhouse effect gases. So we have to change the models on how these companies work. From society, we have to be more aware on how we consume, which companies we're going to support and how we live. But also we need policies from the countries to regulate uh, these the processes of these companies so they can become part of the remediation of, of all of these uh, processes. And just to finish up, uh, international something that is happening is uh, the cases of uh, climate litigation, which is not like a community model, but it, it supports communities uh, to fight against these large companies. So these large companies can assume the charges that they need to for generating these greenhouse effect gases. And there are very interesting cases there of uh, a producer of, of pepper against one of the large energy companies in, in, in Germany uh, for, who is uh, m making a lawsuit against the company because of the effects and how it is, it is causing uh, changes in his household. So there are several things. Apart from what is done uh, locally, which is promoting agroforestry and the systems of agroecology and reivindicate the indigenous people, the role of women, uh, fostering local economies, but also policies at the national level and from the topic of uh, legislation, this kind of climate litigation, which uh, creates evidence and helps the communities in the defense of their territories. So now in terms of food security, um, I, I always say yes to many of the things that Ingrid says because they go hand in hand. Uh, first of all, changing the way in which uh, agriculture is uh, shared, changing uh, the diversity, getting to these communities uh, of vulnerable groups, uh, specifically in rural areas, and fostering the, the school gardens or family gardens that would guarantee the production of food of these families at risk of uh, food insecurity. And we are going to see that the role of, of women is still very important, specifically in these uh, programs, in the WFP or school feeding programs, um, or the family, oh, sorry, the yes the family gardens and also to improve the domestic economy because in the end this translates into a better access to food because specifically in our international in our central american uh, countries it has been proven that women um gets paid or gets money and they're going to use that money for their family. But something that we see specifically in the rural area is that men use it for alcohol or for other things that at the end of the day is not, uh, is not for, for, for buying food. So we can also see that at, uh, at the level of different organizations, the support to these uh, associations of municipalities in, in the production of food, which is important. And at the academia level, which is what I do, academia is focusing 
on um, these programs that are linked together with the society where we collaborate either in making in, in training micro entrepreneurs or creating uh, re supporting research to for them to have a better food production also promoting promoting access of food or or the economic access of food through projects uh, for micro entrepreneurs or to uh, associations of municipalities of producer or producer chains um, to help them with the transformation or to give an added value to the food that they are producing so these uh, productive chains can have a, a greater profitability which will translate at the end of the day in a greater access to food so that's on the one hand and then the academia has always worked through research and we are called to solve the issues of a country so we are focusing or we know very well as as an, as the academia what are the problems that our countries are suffering for from specifically in terms of food security and that's where we focus our uh, investigation and then we you have programs to link that thank you uh to both of you and from your experience we see and 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 both of you had mentioned this before and that because of the growing inequality in the north uh, of central america uh, guatemala honduras and el salvador what role could the industry have in terms of climate change and food security and even though we you mentioned uh, in, in your in your responses we would like to have um, a perspective of, of the role that the industry has but what role they should have Ingrid first of all the private sector uh, specifically the large companies but overall the, the the industry has to be responsible both of what they consume and what what the, the waste and uh, uh, and the process that they implement to create their products that has to be the thing the first thing responsibilities are not going to be diluted just with the selling of the products and it's not our responsibility as consumers or and it's not of the countries it's a, re a direct responsibility of the companies when we talk about the big companies of, of carbon that have generated 60 percent of the greenhouse effect gases but also when we speak about Coca-Cola, which generates enough plastic bottles in a year to go back and forth to the moon 33 years, 33 times every year, and they are not uh, taking responsibility of that package, and they make you purchase um, uh, purchase that bottle when you, when you you only want the liquid and then it's your responsibility to do what to to see what to do with the bottle but it doesn't get it give you an option not to buy that bottle so that is a role that the industry has to be done specifically with the resources that they have of starting transforming their uh, supply chains their production chains so they can be less uh, so they can have less effects in the ecosystems oftentimes what they do is that they try to dilute and they try to reduce the arguments. For instance, a Coca-Cola, one of the arguments that they have is that the, the, the bottle is very heavy and it has, creates more transportation, but most Coca-Cola is produced here, not from, not in, it's not brought from China. So why shouldn't local uh, companies start making these changes? And it should be something that the companies would start seeing how they, they are going to modify. The companies also, the cement companies in El Salvador, the whole thing are the um, uh, cement companies that also use uh, petroleum. But the greatest issue that is being generated right now is that cement is so cheap right now that it's not creating profitability. What they do is that they burn um, 
they burn waste. And what do, do they burn? They burn like tires. So they are they are burning the tires from holsing in El Salvador and in Honduras. And these are things that shouldn't be burning. So the companies that are um, focusing on generating uh, profit without um, seeing the the impact of uh, in the ecosystem and not having consideration of the communities but uh the local community but also worldwide and that change should have happened a long time ago we have enough data enough information and enough alternatives for them to start changing their production distribution processes uh of the main uh products so we would like to see that and not uh, seeing that they want to do greenwashing, which is uh, Coca-Cola. It's not the only one, right? We have Unilever and all of these great companies that that we have here, all of the shampoo, uh, soap that produce a lot of products in plastic that don't need, need to be, to be uh, done in plastic, but they are cheaper. So uh, that's what they are doing doing that and and then we don't have a way to put this packages so instead of changing their processes which is complicated yes but it is feasible and maybe uh, leading to a reduction of their profit yes that's true but that would have an immediate um, change on the lives of the people that live close to these companies to the countries and to the world so instead of making those drastic uh, changes they just try to justify the process so if i used fuel now i'm not going to use fuel i'm going to plant in south america a thousand hectares of sugarcane or a, a thousand hectares of palm to create biodiesel and i'm not gonna reduce my consumption of food i'm not gonna reduce or limit my production i'm gonna look for something that would justify and would give me an argument and saying okay but i am trying to improve i'm not using diesel i am using uh diesel based on african palm in honduras and that gives uh work to the communities but in reality all of these projects of biodiesel unfortunately have also effects on climate change, but it's specifically changes in communities where these companies for monocrops um, get to invade the lands and to to create uh, conflicts with water, etc. So let's not fool ourselves with these green initiatives that many uh, companies want to promote to say that they are truly interested in climate change. Or once again, those large companies of um, sodas or of uh, chips that create all, all this plastic garbage instead of uh, making changes in the way they produce, they they just have small campaigns for reforestation uh, and they call it uh, social corporate responsibility and it has nothing to do in terms of the impact that are being created with their production um, processes that they don't want to change because it would affect them economically so as consumers let's not fool ourselves let's keep that in mind sometimes there aren't alternatives and, and it's true it's hard to to stop uh, consuming them but there but th sometimes there are alternatives and even local alternatives and communities are giving this different alternatives like look for them and try to support them and in terms of food security um the main alternative would be at the agricultural level, guaranteeing uh, the diversity of crops, both at the urban level and uh, or at the agricultural uh, level, and uh, as well as the association of municipalities. So for me, something, even though agro experts create more income It creates more impact and it's much more profitable than uh, production. And, and it's better to import corn or even beans from Ethiopia or, or Nicaragua. Um, and, and they always tell you, no, it's more uh, profitable. 
it's better for me to export uh, eggplant or sweet potatoes and then from China, the US, etc. And then I import the local produce. But what we're seeing is that in the end of the day, this becomes uh, a monocrop and it makes it difficult to access to the diversity of crops of the population and specifically of vulnerable groups and uh, what is happening right now with covid it's hard um, we have had a decrease in the diversity of crops and in the diversity of uh, produce that um, people have to access to to consume food and in this way uh, have a stable nutritional level or uh, or guarantee or guarantee nutrition through this product so one of the good policies would be to to make these large producers uh, of, of of crops that have to be rotating for every certain period, they should uh, change uh, their produce, but also include local produce to be sold locally. That way they can guarantee and they can move local economy in the region. It, because what they do is that they produce and they export and what they, what they are doing is that they they are feeding the Chinese. When when I have my neighbor next door who is uh, going hungry because they don't have access to the to the crops, so that's that's one thing. The great extensions of land have to guarantee yes, uh, these many kilometers or or these many hectares are going to be destined for agro export, but also guaranteeing production for the local community and diversity at the local level. And Hazel, something that is very interesting to see how um, the climate change or global warming interacts with food security and how its uh, production happens. Aside from the obvious, we can see data. Uh, for instance, when we speak about the worldwide population uh, that uh, lives with, uh, that is, is under hunger, 70% of that population uh, works on monocrops. And that is something that we cannot understand. How come most of the population that is going hungry is working on uh, systems of agricultural monocrops and they don't have continuous um, access to food. So that just shows you how sick our agricultural production system is, that it's not only creating global warming, but it's also making these terrible effects in society with hunger. Thank you to both of you. It's very ironic, yes, to know that in our countries, in, in Honduras, Alianza Americas has had the opportunity to take delegations of, uh, of uh, Latin American or um, elected officials, and they have seen that large territories of roads in Honduras filled with African palm. So this is where you question uh, yourself. And also, it is important to see the role of, of governments in all these uh, climate actions and, and of, of food quality. And I would like to hear from both of you, what is the role of governments? Ingrid, we can start with you. So in terms of climate change, it's, it's, um, it's organized because of the COP on, on how governments coordinate and get organized around this topic. Each country has to present something called uh, national contributions or determine national contributions, which means as a country, what are my goals to contribute to the mitigation and adaptation of climate change? These are vol volunteered 
And there are two ways, the determined ones or undetermined ones. Uh, for instance, I want to see, and then I'm going to give you a link of, of a summary of all of these, but Honduras has committed that by 2020 is going to reduce in 39% the consumption of firewood in households or that by 2030, they're going to reforest 1 million hectares of forest, or that by 2030, it's going to reduce 15% of its emissions. Those are conditioned. That means that if the governments uh, that created these emissions help me generate a co community projects or modify national policies or technology or transfer of knowledge, I will commit to that. But if no one helps me, then I'm not going to do anything. Of the non-conditioned, usually is uh, presenting reports or presenting uh, network strategies, which is another that Honduras have, or reviewing the national contributions. For for this year, 2020, they had to do those, those revisions. But to create, so those things have to be done, but only to create impact just if they get support. In El Salvador as well, all the NDCs are conditioned. It means that the Salvador says uh, or, uh, that they they had to change by 2020, but we don't know about that. But El Salvador says that if they don't receive uh, transfer of technology and economic support to execute these plans for adaptation and mitigation, they don't commit to anything. Among the things that they have committed to is that by 2025, 30% of increase in renewable energy. By 2025, a decrease in the expense of um, energy wires. There are many in El Salvador that have made progress. Uh, the, the energy grid in El Salvador has made a great advance. And they also have the topic of the million, one million hectares to reforest. Or they also have 27% of the coverage of the watershed has been conserved for by 2025. Forestry reserves have uh, been increased. Um, the loss of water has been reduced in 20%. So there are many commitments that the government set and that every year uh, they go to this uh, convention to review uh, the reports. And in the end, if we see all of the targets, we don't achieve getting ourselves under the 1.5 degrees. That is important to know. As ambitious as this, know that 1 million hectares reducing 20% uh, of the loss of water in, in pipes or uh, the reduction of 30-something percent of the fire use of firewood. Guatemala also talks about 1.3 um, million hectares by... 2045 restorations 1.5 million families benefited from these projects or 22 percent of reduction of emissions by 2030 so it looks very ambitious but we haven't made progress in in any of these and we're almost by in 2030 but even though it sounds ambitious it is not enough at the international level it is not enough if they were achieved we would still be by 2040 we would be four degrees sorry we would be over the 1.5 degrees in 2040 and we would get to almost four degrees and that would be terrible for us as society so on the one hand we need we need to be more ambitious internationally especially for the, the great polluters and the producers of greenhouse effect gas gases like Russia, China, India, Germany, but we need more ambitious from the from the European countries. And the ro the role of our countries that are affected is that we need to demand for these countries to have uh, better ambitions to comply with these ambitions, but also talk about the damages and losses and how we are going to help these communities and who's going to pay for this help to these communities that are affected this is something that our countries have to talk about 
uh, if we don't, no one is going to talk about it. And unfortunately, Central American countries are very lukewarm when we talk about this topic. They don't demand. They just get together in groups of negotiation that includes uh, Russia and China. And they don't want to talk about these losses or gains because they are the ones that are causing uh, climate change. Up until now, there isn't a mechanism to make these calculations and to see who is going to come and contribute with what and who's going to pay with what so these communities that are affected can have to have a, a great uh, benefit in this uh, in this adaptation and mitigation to to climate change. So these governments have to start managing internationally, demanding for these topics to be brought to the table because they're important for us, but locally working on this transformation, radical transformation of the society that we have to do, not focused on a greater economy or on favoring companies, but truly in creating resilience in the communities, favoring the indigenous people and acknowledging the role of women and giving opportunities for women, indigenous groups and uh, rural communities to be developed. In El Salvador, only 12% of the agricultural uh, companies or initiatives are led by women, only 12%. And also that uh, creates a, a greater gap for women to have more insecure food insecurity, but also in a greater um, rate of poor women in comparison to men in the Central American region. And that's the role that these governments uh, should be taking in the region. Yes, innovate as Costa Rica is doing, but mainly fight internationally for our rights and managing those funds for the communities that are going to be affected without forgetting that the fact that um, paying for a damage does not exclude you from changing the behavior that you're having. The fact that we accept compensation for the losses and damages that are happening doesn't mean that they don't have to change and that they're just going just to continue to, to create this contamination that led to this process. And that is something that we cannot forget. We are not only talking about money, we're talking about, yes, we're going to play, put the money, you're going to put the needs that we have to, to solve the situation urgently that these communities are living and um, the vulnerable areas of our Central American region. But also you have to change uh, the patterns and the way of producing, which are creating this pollution. These are two things that have to go hand in hand and one without the other is not enough and cannot be considered a success for us in the region. In terms of food security, all the countries in the region have uh, signed the agreement for zero hunger by 2030. And in terms of uh, climate change, we see that uh, we're almost at 2030 and this is not going to be reduced. Uh, changes are not significant every year. So we have um, created many legislations in terms of food security. But I think that we are very delayed in this race because at least at Central American level, we are going to see that these policies of food security are very recent from 2011, 2012, and even 2017. And, and the population at risk of food uh, security is not something new. And it's the same sectors, the same population uh, from many years ago. So on one hand, even though these policies have been created, the actions that uh, governments do are not enough in terms of food um, security. It's just, uh, it stays in desks, in planning, in, 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 in meetings, but nothing happens in action. Nothing happens in terms of in, increasing the social responsibility of the companies. That is why we have uh, sectors that are uh, 
we have sectors that are not balanced in terms of uh, food security and in terms of the access to resources, economic resources and access to um, produce in terms of in quality and quantity. So on the one hand, the local governments or, or Central American governments, we do have policies, but they have to be uh, put it into action. And we have to remember that food security is the responsibility of a government to guarantee food of an entire population. It's not just saying um, or looking at the agro-industrial uh, sector just from the economy perspective, but I, I have to see that I have responsibility uh, in terms of the food of, of, of my neighbor or the, popu the indigenous population or the rural population and even a lot of the urban population because we're going to see that uh, these uh, cities, which are, which are the main ones in uh, Guatemala, Salvador, and Honduras, don't produce anything. So everything has to be imported from the rural areas. Of the or the agricultural area, so we're going to increase in in price of vegetables and fruit um, in these cities. So what the government do, they make these bags or they create uh, strategies that don't have a significant impact and uh, they don't have even the enough amount. I have seen those bags that the government gives away and it's not enough for a five member uh, family, which is the average um, amount of members in our population. And they do it just once a month and, and that's it. So we have to look for strategies that will truly have an impact as well as in, in terms of, of climate change, they're waiting uh, for for them to be given or what international uh, organizations do or, or, or which programs are in place. Even though FAO through WFP has a lot of influence or, or is very uh, much concerned in improving the nutrition level of these vulnerable groups, but the counter part from the government uh, does not get there. They are delayed, they don't uh, promote, they don't do their, their disbursements or they don't do what the government has to do in their responsibility with these uh, NGOs. So this doesn't happen. So for me, it should be in action. Uh, not much so um, ideas or meetings or or whatever. Actions have to be taken now. They have to take uh, their role and the responsibility that they have on their population because it's the responsibility of the government to guarantee the food security. And this is not only in terms of access or physical and, and economic access to food, but also the quality of the food. Because quality of food in, in many of our countries, or at least here in Honduras, are the good manufacturing um, practices, and that's minimal. There are other standards uh, that will guarantee quality and that would guarantee uh, food safety that will allow for the population to have better food consumption. But all these systems are, are not uh, mandatory. It's an option. So if the company wants or not, it, 
it's not mandatory. And we're going to see that the large companies are the ones that export to the U.S. or that export at a Central American uh, level, um, are the ones that, that apply this. But the, but the micro entrepreneurs, the production chains do not uh, apply this uh, production processes. So on the one hand, we are incentivizing the production of chains of produce, but in terms of quality, it is being left aside. And that has a lot of, of influence because a fruit, uh, a fruit concentrate can get to the to the population, but maybe it doesn't have the quality or the, the, the nutrition that it needs, that the final uh, consumer needs. Um, something, Hazel, that is very important for the governments to take into account and that I forgot to mention is ensuring the participation of civil society, both in planning and decision making. Um, climate governance needs to have transparency and has to be done in a participatory way. We have to acknowledge uh, the communities, not only indigenous and, and ancestral, but also the urban, the rural, the agricultural, the agricultural population. And it's something that we're not looking at in all of the countries of Central America. These uh, spaces for dialogue are closed. And this is due to the policies, but also because of the poss possibility to implement the, the policies in territories. Thank you to both of you. And the, the topic of, or the term of climate um, governance. Um, I like that term. So we're going to try to apply it with advocacy. So just to start wrapping up, from your experience in the academia and international cooperation, how do you see the future landscape? And what recommendations are you give, could, could you give nationally and internationally? And maybe you can be very specific because you have solved many of the doubts that we have had from uh, the people that, that, that have come. So uh, the, your contributions have been very efficient and we thank you very much for that. But we would like to, to see what this future landscape looks like. And, uh, and maybe you can be a little bit more specific in terms of the national and regional aspects that have, that have to be taken into account. So I had already gave some of my recommendations, both uh, international, uh, uh, locally, but in terms of international um, aspects, we have to focus on the damages and locally transforming the agro uh, productive uh, practices, but also including civil society participation for climate governance. So overall, we can see that it's very hard. We are facing a very complicated um, era because of these uh, disease and climate uh, challenges and also the problem with biodiversity and the loss of many species. But on the other hand, we also have the hope of the awakening of all of these youth and children who we are seeing in mass protests that are happening against uh, climate change, the awakening of the awareness of the consumers that are that want to, to see what we are consuming, who we are buying, and we have a great power to generate this pressure and this change towards what we want. We have seen with COVID-19 that we can do it. Uh, who would have uh, told us that we could have been two or three months without flights. And we saw that, that yes, it was possible with great effects in the economy, but it means that we can make changes and that we can react in a fast way when we consider that it is an urgent problem, like in case of COVID. That quick reaction is that what we would like to see in the topic of climate change. And in terms of food security, for me, one of the first recommendations is ensuring the quality of water, both water for human consumption and the water that gets to the crops. And even uh, that it gets to the land, because if we don't have land and water, we are not going to be able to have the uh, growing of the crops that we need. 
food surveillance in one way or the other. Food security, we are all involved in food security. I can say, no, I am not vulnerable group because I have access to to food, but it also has to do with the type of food that I that I purchase and who I am helping with my purchases. That is my responsibility. So all of us have to contribute and to foster this awareness raising in terms of food security, because just as um, there is a food shortage, we also have a large food waste, and not only in the US and Europe, but also uh, we see that Many households have a lot of food waste that could have uh, get to a neighbor in need because I consider that in Central America we don't have to to go very far or walk a long distance to find a person who needs food. So this surveillance or, or, or giving the advice to these association of municipalities and how to do the post-harvest management is very important. Also remembering that these association of municipalities, specifically in the rural area, play a very important role in feeding, uh, promote, in promoting the diversity of, of produce uh, when, when, when these are being planted and for these produce to be consumed and not for them to be destined to be sold because that happens as well, to see the, the final destination of, of these uh, of these uh, products in the, these associations of municipalities. Post-harvest management, promoting the transformation of food with technology that would guarantee not, also food, not only food safety, but also the nutritional content. So at the end of the day, these food can, can serve its purpose, which is nourishing people. Establishing uh, monitoring programs, in terms of uh, food quality because for instance in honduras the monitoring programs are only uh, to get the sanitation permit or to renew a sanitation permit but there is no uh, permanent monitoring that would guarantee this food safety throughout the entire productive chain and in different uh, moments of the year or in different stages of, 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 of the process of, of this food. Also, support from the government to all of these institutions that are working towards, um, towards minimizing the vulnerable population in terms of, of food uh, security, especially uh, women, uh, pregnant women or children, under 12. We can also see monitoring programs and, and taking care of uh, forests or protected areas to guarantee water because once again, if we don't guarantee water access and if we don't ensure the production of water, then at the end of the day, even though we have seed and land, we're not going to be able to um, to grow these crops. Preventive actions also. Now there is enough information and enough monitoring for the climate. So we have to determine how a year is going to be, if it's going to be rainy, uh, last year was dry, but just uh, get ahead of these topics. It's not waiting for us to go hunger, hungry or, or losing crops, but having preventive actions. Our governments are used to, to correct and food security shouldn't be a correction. These should be preventive actions because we have enough information. We have um, a lot of uh, centers that are creating this information in terms of different patterns, uh, consumption patterns, uh, climate patterns. So it's just taking the information and analyzing it and 
preventing and, and not why should I why should I wait for 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 the drought to come and lose everything we should start working with the farmers and telling them you shouldn't uh, be growing right now because drought is coming you have to wait and 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 start uh, planting uh, on the on another month or or, or the contrary this is going to be a rainy uh year there are going to be areas that are going to get flooded because we have that information of, of the regions that get flooded so let's use this information and 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 see which actions can be taken to prevent the loss of crops because at the end of the day it's going to have a repercussion not only in in economy but also in the access to food so i think we're over seven minutes <laughs> when we were going to finish and i'm i reiterate that many of the questions that happened throughout this webinar were um, responded by you and we thank you very much we thank Ingrid and Gabriela for giving us such good contributions to understand and the situation in the north of Central America in terms of climate change and food security as factors that promote the migration of the population from these uh, countries to the north it has been a great opportunity to understand the challenges and the realities on, on the effects of, of climate change in central america and the impact in um the nutrition and the food security of of the population not only the quantity but in the in the amount in the kind of food and also in the sustainable um food for for these patients and this uh new styles of, of life for the urban and rural area. So in other words, uh, the products that our countries need shouldn't be uh, at the cost of nature. So we want to thank you uh, for being with us in this conversation that you have uh, remained until the end. We invite you to um, continue being on top of our webpage and our social media and all of the work that we do uh, transnationally. I hope you have a good day and thank you very much for both of you for participating in this, uh, in this process. So thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. And uh, for me as a final message, I want to say that uh, food security is a commitment of everyone, not only of the government or a company, but what I'm, what I'm doing in my day to day. Um, I'm just going to, uh, I have real quick two things. If El Salvador has a food security policy, there isn't one, but uh, a food security policy is being promoted uh, by FAO in El Salvador for this policy to be built. And there are some articles that cannot be ratified or uh, that have has to do in how to um, to sell or, or to create uh, announcements of, of foods that are not good for health, like chips or soda, but it's being discussed. So we have to continue that discussion that is happening in the assembly and support for it to be ratified and for this um, law to pass. And the other one was about uh, if climate change um, has an effect uh, in food security and yes, First, food security is, is sorry, food sovereignty is, is something that is looked for. And it is a, a concept that is political concept on, on the practice and the social transformation of this agricultural process uh, systems that we're talking about. It's not speaking only about food security. Uh, food security is not only having access to food, but food sovereignty is that every nation has to develop their capacity to produce food, but also with the diversity needed and the right to produce in their own land and in the scale that each community and each state decides. So this is a political stance. It, there are initiatives, yes. There is um, 
one that fights for that uh, food severity and has representation in the region, but in all the local uh, communities that produce their their food and and that don't uh, do don't do monocrops is food sovereignty. They are fighting for that so food sovereignty to become a reality. So it is a, a process. In El Salvador, we have the National Committee for Family uh, Feeding which is working towards a policy for agroforestry, uh, food security. They're trying to reinvindicate the role of communities and, and peasant families in the production of food. Let's not forget that these, um, these small plots of land are the ones that feed the world in 80%. It's not the monocrops, it's the small peasant families that want that, that ones that feed us. So let's not, um, fool ourselves saying that if these uh, monocrops are changed we're gonna go uh, hungry because it's not true we our feeding comes from these peasant families we don't eat only sugar or pineapple which are these monocrops so um, there are many initiatives of food sovereignty in the region and climate change affects it because it makes it more difficult for the independent production um independent uh, production because of, of this i don't know if gabriela would like to contribute a little bit in this terms in terms of food sovereignty so once again, um, it is the responsibility of the government to guarantee um, to guarantee the contribution of food for their uh, population, promoting policies that would create changes and that would be positive impacts in the diversity of crop and access to food in even in employability for all the factors that intervene or that interfere in 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 food security would guarantee the production of ethnic crops the seeds so they won't be lost or or traditional crops and we're not only talking about corn and beans uh we're also talking about the influence of this transnational companies in changing the type of crops that are being planted <clears throat> so a lot of things are being done by the government but but it is not enough and it's not going to be enough to say zero hunger by 2030. We have to be much more aggressive in the policies and in what we guarantee in food sovereignty and what we are going to promote more than an economic uh, level, but also not forget that food security is is the nutritional contribution of a food that would guarantee the health of the population it's not only production of food thank you uh thanks to both of you i think we are all we're all very nourished in this topic now. So I thank all of the people who stayed until the end and I invite you all to be um, to be on top of our uh, social media and also the work that H Gold does and Ausan from the from the Food Security Observatory from the National Autonomous University of Honduras. Thank you very much and have a good day.